So I've been on a bit of a kart binge lately because I find that era of racing very interesting and I think that the split is one of my favourite stories in motorsport history ever. The others being the story of the Ford GT and that whole vendetta against Ferrari that they had as well as the we can debate this until the cows come home controversy, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it that was option 13. And like I said before, I love option 13 so much I went as far as to name a sim racing team after it. But what interests me about kart is that in the 1990s it was probably the only thing that could rival Formula 1 in terms of pace, star power and things like that. But when I say pace I mean one lap pace because on an oval, you know, a kart car, an indie car, a champ car, whatever you want to call it, would absolutely slaughter a Formula 1 car. Speeds around Indianapolis at that time were nudging 240 miles an hour. That's pretty quick. And I even went as far as to attempt to give you an indication the other day when I used the medium of sim racing to pit a late 90s IndyCar against a Formula 1 car from around the same era. And over 5 laps the gap was about 16 seconds. And the IndyCar would have made the grid for the 1999 Spanish Grand Prix using the 107% rule. It would have been at the back, but it would have made it onto the grid. And that video triggered a multitude of repeat comments, chief among which being, well of course the Formula 1 car was going to be faster, why did you even bother doing this? Completely missing the point of the video. And the other was, cool, now do it the other way around. Do a Formula 1 car on an oval. And I think I probably should. I mean, I have to make some modifications to the Formula 1 car to get it to have a modicum of a chance against the champ car, like take the wings off it. But what if I told you that this has already been done? Now some people in the audience might already be trying to get clever in the comments saying that in the 1950s the Indy 500 was part of the Formula 1 World Championship but they weren't necessarily Formula 1 cars because at that time the Indy 500 was run to USAC rules and not to CIS rules, what the FIA was called at that time. And one question I did get asked on Friday is why doesn't the FIA just lob an oval onto the calendar and have an oval race? Well I mean in theory it could be done but F1 cars aren't designed to handle three types of tracks like an Indy car is. F1 cars only handle streets and real tracks. Indy cars have to handle street tracks, real tracks and ovals and are designed so that they can run at all three without having to design an all new car. And F1 teams aren't going to design a car for one race, especially now with the budget caps. Take this as an example. Mercedes will design a car that will be good at most tracks but will sacrifice Monaco because it's such an anomaly on the calendar. They might as well focus on the other 20 or so races. It's also part of how Michelin came undone at Indianapolis in 2005. They weren't going to design a tyre for one corner at one race of the season. But there were other reasons as well but that's a whole other video that I've done at least twice already. But back to the point of the video and I do ask that you take this with a grain of salt because it might be 100% true but it might be exaggerated because it was written in Autosport around 1994 or so so it might have just been, you know, Senna-mania. Well, I mean, you don't want to really call it Senna-mania but you know what I mean, that whole stuff around Senna's death but it was written in Autosport but it's been retold by memory by a man called Declan Hackett over on Quora and this is something that I discovered when I was looking up the pace difference between a 90s Formula 1 car and a 90s Indy car to see if there was a way of just putting those facts and figures out for you in that video but if it is completely 100% true and not just based off rumour because you know no internet back in 1994 in the way that we know it today but Point remains, or long story short, TLDR, whatever you want to call it, a Formula 1 team did run at an oval, and they weren't terrible. In the 1990s, the way the teams pulled in most of their sponsorship money was through tobacco, so you had teams like Williams, Benetton, McLaren, Ligier and so on, dressed up in the colours that these death sticks came in, which meant that there were very colourful liveries on the TV that really stuck out in the poor quality television compared to today that we had back in the 90s. One of these sponsors was Marlborough, who were the title sponsors of McLaren and Ferrari in the 1990s up until 1996, and the McLarens were dressed up in a white and sort of day glow orange red colour scheme until the end of 1996, and then when you've got that livery coupled with a yellow, green and blue helmet of a certain Brazilian driver, it's an iconic combo. 
But Marlboro's reach wasn't just limited to McLaren and Ferrari. To compare them to a modern day sponsorship machine, you'd probably compare them to Red Bull in terms of overall brand reach. You'd have drivers have little Marlboro logos on their suits and on their helmets, and even some of the back of the grid teams in Formula 1 had little tiny Marlboro logos on the cars because they were the drivers' personal backers rather than the teams. And over in America, Marlboro was the title sponsor of Team Penske, the biggest and most successful team in American open wheel racing. The Penske cars were also dressed up in the same colours as the McLarens, and in 1991 Formula 1 was visiting the city of Phoenix, Arizona for the first race of the Formula 1 season. And with it being the first race of the season, McLaren had taken two MP46 cars with them with the all-new Honda V12 engine in the back, but they'd also taken two MP45Bs with them with the V10 in the back because, you know, first race of the season, no guarantee of reliability. They'd also brought two more MP45s as backups, and, you know, it's stuff that wouldn't happen today. Philip Morris, the parent company of the Marlboro cigarette brand, asked McLaren if they could spare a couple of cars for a photo shoot. Given that Marlboro is an American cigarette brand, Formula One was racing in the United States, and it's unconfirmed, but I'm assuming that Penske might have also been there so that they could get one big happy Marlboro family. You might be thinking, well, why didn't Ferrari go along? They were also sponsored by Marlboro at that time, but you know, McLaren were the constructors' champions and the drivers' champions, albeit in highly controversial circumstances, so they're not going to want the first of the losers there, are they? Now also in Phoenix is the Phoenix International Raceway, an oval circuit, and that's where the photo shoot was. So Senna, Berger, two MP45Bs and the pit crew went along to the Phoenix International Raceway and they started doing their filming, they got their photographs, they got everything they needed. Just after lunchtime they decided they were done and then McLaren was free to, to leave, go back to the hotel, go back to the the street circuit, whatever it is they needed to do. But they had the track for another couple of hours. And they had two cars. They also had two drivers. And they got a pit crew. You can see where this is going, can't you? As you can imagine, a bunch of British-based mechanics didn't know how to set up a car for an oval, so they just went, screw it, set it up for Hockenheim. That's the fastest track we go to in terms of top speed. So they sent Berger and Senna out to do some laps. By the time they were done a couple of hours later, it's said that the two McLarens were able to do a 22.11 lap lap time, which is an average speed of about 162-163 miles an hour. One month later, Cart was there for the Valvoline 200 and Rick Mears put his car on pole with an average speed of 168.3 miles an hour, which equates to 21.4 seconds, give or take. Now, consulting the qualifying times for that race, it would have meant that the Formula 1 cars would have been mid grid and they'd set their times on a cold track with no rubber laid down with a crew that only had knowledge of low downforce running at Italy and Germany every year. But if they had raced the cars probably wouldn't have lasted very long. Formula 1 engines aren't designed to run near the red line for extended periods of time and even in the days where the rev limit was 20,000 revs a minute I think only Ford actually hit 20k but even then that was only in testing. And now today on tracks like Monza and Baku where the straights are incredibly long Modern Formula 1 cars don't get that close to the red line either unless they're really, really, really trying to catch up to the guy ahead because, you know, rationing engines and stuff like that. So whether it would have been the engine that blew or a tyre that blew first, it's probably a flip of a coin, really. But anyway, that's an interesting tidbit of information I found while searching an internet the other day. And if you thought it was interesting, then be sure to give it a like. And if you have any more info from that Autosport article, or if it turns out it was just a load of rubbish, you can let me know more in the comments. And then that way, everybody learns something. And while scrolling down, if you haven't already, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. And make sure you also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do here. Also, a huge thank you to the patrons of this channel via Patreon. If you want to help support this channel at a more personal level, you can help by following the link in the description where there will also be a link to Discord and also some vague directions to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord. Have a great day, Ravi Live, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.